It was the summer of 1999, and Hirohiko Araki, acclaimed author of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, had just finished the fifth part of his long-running series, Golden Wind. And before continuing on to Stone Ocean, the sixth part, he decided to do something a bit different. He wanted to experiment and make a small little series about a character no one would really expect, a ghost. And it seems like it wouldn't really connect to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure whatsoever, seeing as there were no stands in any of the previews for it, and the ghost premise was something JoJo had barely touched before, except when you talk about Raimi from Part 4. But what really cemented this idea that this wasn't related to JoJo was the fact this wasn't even published in Shonen Jump. Dead Man's Questions was published in Manga Almond Magazine from the 12th to 14th issues of the year 1999. I guess you could say it was a pretty bizarre summer. Although on the outside it looks completely unrelated to Jojo, this spin-off actually continues the storyline of one of my personal favorite characters, and I'm not going to tell you who it is because Araki purposely hid their identity from the reader until the end of the first chapter. So with that, let's dive right into the chapter, how the story lays out, and everything about Dead Man's questions. This is Jojo's Bizarre Lecture, and I hope you enjoy. Something I want to say first and foremost is the fact that Araki is incredibly mysterious when it comes to this first chapter. We have no idea about the premise, the characters, or the world, so I think him slowly drip feeding us information about just everything is really really compelling, and it gets you hooked every single time there's a different twist or something completely unexpected. So I'm going to start in the most blank and normal way possible, which is a man trying to look through a bookstore. Our unnamed protagonist at this point is very hypervigilant, trying not to bump into anyone or cause much of a commotion whatsoever. He's trying to find three specific items, a picture of someone with a hat, a phone, and a fruit knife. And now we have no clue who this guy is or why he's doing any of these things, but we see him go on his adventure to try and find these items. It's also here where we discover that the man is actually completely penniless, having no money to his name whatsoever. Which leads us to think, how did he get on that train? And why is this thing called Dead Man's Questions? Is this perhaps an allegory as to people not having wealth being considered dead in society? Rocky is pretty heady, so that is possible. The man uses the ripped up picture that he found in the bookstore to actually infiltrate into a woman's home by disguising himself as a delivery man. However, it doesn't go very well for him, and the woman is consistently suspicious of everything that's happening, saying she didn't order any package, and she's confused why this would even be the case. However, our hero insists that she has to sign something, and she actually allows it to happen, opening her mail slot. However, when she looks through the mailbox, she realizes that nobody was there at all. And somehow, our protagonist has snuck into this woman's home through the minuscule gap of a mail slot. As he scours the house, we see a lot of new things about this character that they're not able to enter a room without being allowed in, similar to a vampire, and that dogs are able to see him while other people are seemingly not able to see him. And he also has the ability to face through walls and everything, which basically confirms to us that this character is in fact a ghost, like I said earlier, but I wanted to keep the whole mystery angle so I didn't explain that, but you knew that already. While our main character is searching for the phone, we get some introspection. Sort of highlighting some of the stuff I mentioned earlier about how people who are poor in society are considered the same level as a dead man. And I think this stuff is truly really fascinating. Araki's always able to bring some real life commentary into the most fantastical of storylines and I think it works super well in this regard. And we get to see that our main character is seemingly hunting after these tools for a job of some kind. However, it seems like dogs are the antithesis of ghosts in this universe, which honestly is absolutely hilarious in my opinion. Araki has always been one to kill dogs, we all know this, so the fact that dogs are the antithesis of our main character and are the ones that could possibly stop them is just hilarious in my opinion. But the main character is drawn away and they have to find a knife some other way to finish their job. At the beginning of this story, our ghostly hero reads about an Oak Tree Hill child murder case. And as it so happens to be the case, our main hero is chasing down the person who caused that murder for their job. As it turns out, they're actually some sort of spiritual hitman, which reminds me a lot of you, Hawk Show in a way, you know, spirit detective. But this person that they're chasing down is actually kind of interesting in my opinion. They seem to be focusing on what's real and what's imaginary a lot, and that makes me think about him knowing that ghosts are a real thing. Perhaps that's the reason they actually turned out to be this way. Araki has given us twist after twist in this storyline, but nothing even begins to compare to the bombshell reveal that the main character we've been following this entire time, this heroic ghost hitman, is actually the ghost of acclaimed serial killer 
Yoshikage Kira, the main villain of part 4, not even in Shonen Jump. And this is just insane. I cannot begin to tell you how much thematic greatness there is right here. Kira killing another killer. There's just there's just so much here. But I'm going to get into that as the story goes on because now that's the end of the first chapter and let's talk about what's so great about this. I personally think the most daring and inventive thing about Dead Man's Questions, besides continuing the ghost narrative from part 4, is actually making the main protagonist of the story Yoshikage Kira. Ironically enough, the person who was killed solely because of ghosts in his own part. But he hid this on purpose and I think this made it even better, because we had this whole predisposed impression of Kira for being a horrible, completely garbage human being when in reality, this new protagonist is a pretty solid guy. Now this has a lot of people wondering obviously, why is his character so different from Kira and why does his attitude seemingly change in the ghost world? Is there a new type of personality implanted here? There's a lot to discuss and Araki goes further in this quote right here. I wrote the story with the idea of a protagonist who, even after death, seeks peace of mind and continues to live in this world in the form of a spirit. I'd call it an A-type work. The protagonist of Dead Man's is actually the ghost of the main villain from the fourth part of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, the deceased homicidal maniac known as Yoshikage Kira. In the world of the dead, if there indeed is one, it probably wouldn't be a place where everything is possible. Rather, it'd be regulated by rules similar to our own worlds. The idea that ghosts have to struggle with just as much or even more than normal people is quite peculiar. That's the idea I had in mind when writing this story. Even so, when I got to the scene where he discovers he can no longer listen to his favorite music, I got a little teary-eyed. Although I couldn't find any information as to- Bro, I swear to god, I'm gonna be a dead man if this, like, saw or whatever keeps going on in the background. Putting that aside for now, I couldn't find any information as to whether or not this idea of having Kira as the protagonist of this spinoff led to the creation of Josuke being a fusion of Kira and Josufumi. Obviously, I don't know if this is inherently connected, but I do think it's an interesting connection to see that Araki had this idea at all in the first place and then decided to do it over a decade later. And when you reread this first chapter with the knowledge that this is Kira, a lot of these lines become a lot more interesting. But I'm not going to tell you everything word for word because I want you guys to check this story out for yourselves because one, it's only three chapters and two, it's super, super cool. Although Araki didn't necessarily need to connect the story back to Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, he could have used this to make a new ghost theme storyline, which honestly, for these three chapters, is really great. But with that all out of the way, let's get into the two remaining chapters of Dead Man's Questions, which are really interesting because they're actually connected together. This isn't some type of one-shot series, it's actually one coherent narrative with the last chapter even connecting to this second one. Rocky introduces us to this monk woman, who is the one who actually tasks Kira for doing all these assignments to send these people who are horrible people to the netherworld, which seems to be the place where ghosts are supposed to go after death. However, Kira still looms around, and that raises a lot of questions. But the biggest question right now is the fact that he's not after a specific target, but after a mansion ghost, which is literally an entire house that was destroyed in one specific event which allowed everything in the house to become a ghost. And honestly, this is such a wild premise and I love it to death. I can't believe Araki just keeps coming through with premises that get even more crazy than just a ghost Kira storyline. Now I want to highlight this page in specific because I personally believe this is one of the best, if not the best pages in the entire spinoff. This monk woman asks Kira why he chooses to remain in the world of the living and not move on to the netherworld. Does he have some sort of agenda? And knowing Kira, he clearly doesn't. Although this version of Kira doesn't remember his living self, he clearly has some of the same nature as them. He just seems to want to keep killing no matter what. And it's really interesting. Instead of doing it just for the satisfaction of killing itself, he's doing it for money and trying to regain that status he had as a living person. And I think this is a really interesting direction for his character, but it gets even better. Kira then doubles down on his belief saying this, How can you, who's still living, be so sure that there is another world? What if it doesn't exist? And I think this is really interesting because she's obviously meant to be a monk, someone who's meant to purify evil spirits from the world. Maybe she's trying to coerce Kira to finally just move on to the other world and stop killing people senselessly. There's even the possibility that she was actually stumped by Kira's question. 
What if there is no such thing as a netherworld? Which sounds inherently negative, but this could really hurt someone who's still living. There is no afterlife? And she's a monk in the first place. She probably does believe in the afterlife. There's a lot here, and I just find this incredibly fascinating. Now I'm going to skip to Kira getting to the mansion ghost, and I just found this absolutely adorable. Kira, obviously, being a ghost, isn't allowed to just grab normal objects, otherwise it would be a floating object in the middle of nowhere. But with Kira having all these ghost objects, he's able to actually do things like read and listen to music and all these things he used to enjoy when he was alive. But unfortunately, Kira broke a few eggs when he was inside the mansion, and this leads to, I cannot believe I'm saying this, Kira fighting ghost chicken monsters. Yes, I love Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, how'd you know? Now, since a lot of the third and final chapter is a fight, I'm not gonna really talk about it that much because one, I don't wanna show you all the art, and two, it's not that much to talk about. There's a fight with some ghost chicken monsters. It's actually pretty sick. I love the art for a lot of it, but I'm not gonna show you the fight because people read fights at their own pace. And one of the best parts of Jojo's is the shock of what happens during a fight and seeing the unpredictability of each stand coming into play. And now obviously there aren't stands in here, but there are literally ghost chicken monsters. Yes, I'm saying this a second time to show you that there don't have to be stands for it to be bizarre. This isn't even the first ghost chicken that Kira's met anyway, so what's the big deal? And the chapter and the entire spinoff ends with Kira realizing that the monk just wanted to have him dead and killed by these chicken egg ghost monster things. And honestly, I think this is a great start to a story. We have a new goal for our main character, a really cool idea for the world, new powers, a new entire way to explore the world and talk about society as a whole. There's a lot here. I think it's a really great package that Araki could have developed on more, and I think it would have been really interesting. However, in the winter of that year, Araki decided to graze us with Stone Ocean, and honestly, I think I'm fine with Dead Man's Questions ending for Stone Ocean to exist. But if Araki did ever want to return to this idea, like how he does with the Thus Spoke Rohan Kishibe spinoff, I would absolutely love to see it. While reading this, literally, this is editing Kevin as we're speaking right now, I just realized that the entirety of chapters 2 and 3 comprise of a whole chicken and egg theme, where does the spirit come from, the being inside of the mom or the mom, there's so much here. That's why he's the GOAT. That's 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 why he's the GOAT. That's all I gotta say. And with that, that's the end of the first episode of the new series I want to start on this channel called JoJo's Bizarre Lecture. The JoJo series is so massive and multiple, multiple decades spanning that I think having a source where people could learn about these more niche topics in the community would not only be super helpful, but get people more interested in the less known works that Araki has made. Whether it be a spin-off of JoJo or some little one-shots he's done that I think are really interesting. And I just think it'd be fun to talk about this type of stuff because I haven't seen people really talk about it that much. I'm going to use this type of format in order to talk about not only spinoffs that I really want to talk about, like I've been dying to talk about Crazy Diamond's Demonic Heartbreak, but I thought I could do it in a way that goes volume by volume, allowing for more people to get more interested in the story faster. And I also wanted to talk about one of the best games Capcom has ever made in my opinion, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Heritage of the Future, a phenomenal fighting game based on Stardust Crusaders, and I feel like this would be the perfect way to do so. If you enjoyed, consider supporting the channel, because this will be a long-running series on the channel, and if you want to learn any niche Jojo stuff, you know where to stay. This has been your course in Dead Man's Questions 101, hopefully you enjoyed, and if you learned anything, consider sticking around for more.